Well, let's return to the story of Joseph and Judah and the brothers, the sons of Jacob. If you would open your Bibles to Genesis, the chapter, uh, chapter 45. We've gone through, what, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, eight chapters so far, if I count my fingers right. Chapter 45, 1 through 15. Then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. He cried, make everyone go out from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers And he wept aloud so that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come near to me, please. And they came near. And he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep you alive, to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Do not tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children and your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. There I will provide for you. And there are yet five years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have do not come to poverty. And now your eyes see, and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see, that it's my mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father and all my, of all my honor in Egypt and of all that you have seen. Hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell on his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept upon his neck, and he kissed all of his brothers and wept upon them. After that, his brothers talked with him. Let us pray. O oh Lord our God, only you bring peace. Only you bring reunion. Only you bring oneness. Only you, O oh God, forgive sin. Only you, O God, deliver from death. Only you, O God, give eternal life. There is no hope, no life, no peace except by Jesus. That's our confession. And that's why we are here. We are here because you are God and we are your people. And it is our deepest and greatest joy. So, Lord, we feed upon your word. It is life. It is the bread which nourishes us, we would be like Jesus. We would hear about Jesus. As the disciples said, let us hear of Christ. We would hear of Christ alone. No other news but Christ. In His name we rejoice. Amen. Well, in all these chapters we have looked at so far, Everything that has transpired to date, going back to chapter 37 from Joseph's dreams and his brother's betrayal of him, all the way through to Judah offering himself as a substitute instead of Benjamin. We saw just last Sunday, all these events, all these years have been moving forward. God has directed all these events to this very event, this very happening, the reunion of Jacob's family, Israel as one, we might say. Well, in my youth, there was a band with a funny name, his name called Three Dog Night, kind of a strange name, some of you remember it. 
And they sang a song about the number one. One, I won't sing it to you. If, if you sing it, you're going to get it in your head the rest of the day, so don't do it. But one is the loneliest number that you'll ever hear. Remember that song? Well, let me tell you this. Scripture disagrees with that. Because in Scripture, one is a very positive and very important number, particularly to Jesus in his prayer, high priestly prayer in John 17, and also to Paul in Ephesians chapter 2. Now, let's speak of Paul first. Paul wrote to the Ephesians and to us, to all believers, to the church, that Christ has made the two one. He has brought the two together into one. And Paul said that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, thus making peace. Now, modern Christians, we tend to emphasize the individual aspect of salvation. And that is no doubt of critical importance. You must believe the gospel. You must trust in Christ, okay? You must abide in Christ. That's very important. But because of that, we tend to neglect a larger issue, which is that oneness or that peace, that reconciliation that Christ has accomplished, that we, in fact, as believers, become one body. And that one body is a dwelling place, Paul said at the end of Ephesians 2, a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. We are that body. We are the dwelling place for God. Now think of our Lord's prayer in John 17. He prayed that they, meaning all those who would come to Him, all those He would gather, His shepherd, His church, that they may become perfectly one. And then he says this, so, what's the reason? So that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. So this realized oneness, if I can call it that, that Jesus accomplishes in the gospel, in his messianic ministry, is vital to the church's witness and mission Because again, what Jesus is doing eschatologically involves the formation of one body or one family. This body who dwells with God in peace. And so as as we look in Genesis 45, this family reunion, which is described here, this coming together of the two. Who's the two? Rachel and Leah, the divided parties, the divided families, okay? The wives and the the divided sons, they became one, how? Through the ministry of Judah, by offering himself as a substitute for Benjamin in love for his family. Bringing salvation and peace. And that offer foretells of the oneness or the reconciliation that Jesus accomplishes through his ministry as the Christ. Now, in the story, we see, as we read straight away, that when Joseph heard of Judah's offer in the previous chapter of this laying down his life, for his family, of this offer of becoming a slave that his family could go home in peace and be safe. Well, Joseph knew that the past anger and the jealousy were gone and that this new loving unity and willingness to give to the others had replaced this past division and enmity that had gripped the family for decades. And Joseph could no longer control himself. This man so overcome with emotion, so overwhelmed by gratitude was he that his family had finally come together in this reunion of love. Now, I am convinced that you know that one of the greatest heartaches of life, of human life in this world is broken relationships. 
they are incredibly painful. For example, and I think about this, having performed weddings, having attended weddings, you watch the couple pledge their love in front of witnesses. And you know that later on, many of those couples will end up in divorce court with bitterness and anger, divided. Or you can think of broken friendships or church divisions. We all have, unless you're very young, we all have experienced broken, destroyed relationships. I have had people that profess to love me turn around and try to destroy my life. People who were in my house eating bread at my table. You have as well. It's desperately painful. Well, conversely, one of our greatest joys is relational reconciliation, the healing of a marriage, the, the reunion of friends or a church or some relationships, okay? It's a time of great happiness, a, trim, a time of celebration and feasting, really, when those who seem to be permanently divided, irreconcilable differences, when by God's grace they come together in restored peace and unity. It's time to, fill, to kill the fattened calf. Remember when the prodigal son came back? The son who, who hated his father and asking for his inheritance, he was saying, Dad, I want you dead. I hate you. I don't want to be part of your family. I wish you were dead. I want my inheritance now. He came back. And the father threw this great party for his returning son. Joseph, we see, he wept aloud. He kissed his brothers. He wept. He was emotional. I recently experienced this joy. Maybe not quite that much. But in recent weeks, it became clear to me that there was an issue between me and someone who has been very important to me for almost 20 years, I guess, and I to him. Each of us was upset with the other person. And so one day, about two weeks ago, I felt urged on by the Holy Spirit to, to give him a call. And I did. And I shared my concerns, and he shared his. And guess what? Each one of us had misunderstood the other. Each one of us had made an assumption that turns out wasn't true. And there was great happiness on that phone. It was a beautiful reconciliation. And it was, a, it was a tremendous joy to both of us. We prayed together. We thanked God for that phone call. He had prayed just the day before. He told me that, that Mike would call me because he was hurting. And I was hurting for no reason. We had made just an assumption. But the reconciliation was beautiful. I will tell you this, and you know it as well. Problems and divisions and stresses and struggles will come to your relationships, I promise you. Guaranteed, every one of your relationships, will, if it's close enough, will have a problem, a sting, a, pro, a, a struggle at some point. Children, hear me. You will have struggles in your friendships, struggles with your future marriage, struggle with your future kids, and then with you. We are sinners. And I say you, you, you put two sinners together, it's like putting dynamite and a match too close together. There's going to be a bang someday, right? The only uncertainty is how you handle those problems. And so because of the certainty of problems and because of our witness to God's peace in Christ, the Bible requires every one of us to pursue reconciliation and peace. It's simply not possible to witness to gospel reconciliation, to gospel peace, while there are divisions in our relationships. So when there are those breaks, when there are those struggles, when there is, a, when, when there is that disharmony, we are required to pursue peace. I'll give you two verses. You know them well, I'm sure. Matthew 18, 15. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. Just you and him, or just you and her. 
the two of you privately, go talk about it. Like I called this person. Not that, not that he faulted me. I thought he did. But anyway, go to him. Go to that person. Talk about it, okay? But then there's also Matthew 5, 23. If, in the Sermon on the Mount, if you are worshiping, basically, he says if you're offering a gift of sacrifice, if you're worshiping and there you remember that someone has something against you, Leave your gift there, go away, go be, recon- go be reconciled with your brother, and then come back and worship. So if you think someone has something against you, or if you have something against someone else, go and be reconciled. That's what the Bible is saying. Don't accept a broken relationship as the last word. Don't give up on someone. Don't wash your hands of someone. You don't want someone giving up on you. And you know who doesn't give up on you ever? God. God does not give up on you. Think about it. Think of all your sins. Think of all your indifferences. Think of all of the times you don't pray. You don't read your word. You're you're indifferent to Him. You go off and wandering. God is patient. God is long-suffering. God is enduring. God does not say, I'm sick of Mike. He's done one thing too many. I'm walking away. God is patient. He is long-suffering. Think about Jesus. I mentioned this verse earlier. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. What joy was that? The joy of reconciling sinners with God. The joy of forgiving you and me. He endured the pain and prison that was rightfully ours. That's amazing. We see that in Joseph, and he said, it was not you who sent me here, but God. Why? Because God had this plan to save our family from this famine and many others to keep us alive. There's still five more years If it wasn't for me being in Egypt sent by God, we would all perish in this famine. If God didn't send His Son, we read it, John 3.16, right? We would all perish in the famine of not knowing Him. Let the reality of the gospel of reconciliation be the MO in all of your relationships. You're not an orphan. You are who? You're a son or daughter of the living God. And that means you're a member of his family, one with others in that family, his other sons and daughters. And the spirit of peace and unity dwells within you. So Paul said this also to the Ephesians. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you are called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all, one... (laughs) One, one, one. Pursue spiritual oneness. Listen, my friends. You can separate from others. You can wash your hands of them. And you can experience spiritual poverty and loneliness. Well, then maybe one is a bad number. And you can dishonor the Spirit of Christ. Or you can experience, or you can pursue oneness and experience the great joy of, of that restored peace and unity. That's what Joseph is experiencing right here because of his mercy, because of his love, because of his humility, okay? He had goosebumps of delight. His emotions came over him in these waves of happiness and joy. And then he sent people away the others and and, and in private he revealed his identity to his brothers he said i am joseph can you imagine i want to be a fly on that wall 
Can you imagine the look on these brothers' faces? Are you for real? Joseph? Our brother, the one we sent off 22 years ago to slavery? The one before whom we just bowed down? Are you serious? Joseph? The second most powerful man on earth? Mora says it's perhaps the most dramatic confrontation and reunion in all literature. They were speechless, struck dumb. The ESV says they were dismayed at their presence. It actually, it actually means they were terrified. The ESV, I think the NIV translates that. They were terrified in Joseph's presence because they knew that Joseph at that moment could have his way with them. And Joseph was going to have his way with them. And so he says, <laughs> I love this, come near, brothers. <laughs> what would you be thinking? Would you be terrified? And Joseph, seeing that terror, he says, I'm your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. What's he doing? He's reminding them of the truth. Truth. He's reminding them of what they did. And that the man before whom they were standing, the, the second most powerful man on earth, the ruler of Egypt, before whom they had just bowed down, was the one they sold into slavery with malice and cruelty in their hearts. Unforgiving. Unmerciful. And he had been there ever since, all these years, cut off from his father and his family, not even knowing if his father was well or alive. They had sinned, and they had sinned terribly. Later on, he would say to them straightforward, in straightforward language, you meant this for evil. You were cruel. You were mean. You were beyond that. You meant evil against me. Joseph was not whitewashing the truth. He was not going to pretend that, hey, he just came here on vacation and decided to stay. See, the truth, dear ones, must not be denied. It's so important to acknowledge our sins. It's critically important to acknowledge our sins I love what Spurgeon says, actually pretty much all the time. But here's what he said one time. Oh, there are many who quite misunderstand the gospel. They misunderstand the gospel. They think that their good works qualify them to come to Christ. Whereas sin is the only qualification for man to come to Jesus. What qualifies you to come into God's presence, your good works? No, that disqualifies you. What qualifies you? Acknowledging that you are bankrupt in spiritual assets, that you are a desperate sinner. If you deny your sin, that's the certain way to remain unforgiven. John said it this way, the Word of God, if we say we have no sin, there is no truth in in us. To be forgiven, you must acknowledge your sin. But here's the wonder of the gospel. And I bet you can recite this verse. If we confess our sins, He is, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Joseph is reminding his brothers that they had sinned desperately. They meant evil against him. But with God, there is forgiveness. Amen? Look at what he says. Do not be distressed with or angry with yourselves. God sent me here before you to preserve life. For the famine has been two years, yet five more years. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. It's time to move on, Joseph, saying, you've acknowledged your sin, you've confessed your sin, it's forgiven. Now it's time to rejoice that God is doing a wondrous thing. 
through their sin. Recognize God's forgiveness and dwell on it no longer. And recognize God's greatness in bringing goodness even out of evil. Joseph is a marvelous theologian here. Because he is recognizing, as we must, both personal responsibility, you have sinned, and God's sovereignty. As Peter would say later on to Israel, you crucified Christ on the cross. You meant evil, but God raised him up and made him Savior. And you now can be saved because of the evil that you have done. See, Joseph saying, you sent me to Egypt, but God sent me here. And Joseph was able to see that what we sang earlier, that invisible hand of God's providence, that God directed his life to cause all things to work together for good. And that faith in his heart, that understanding, produced acceptance of the will of God and contentment in these circumstances, even joy. Notice that Joseph is actually rejoicing in God's providence, the very providence that sent him into Egypt as a slave, away from his family, and yes, as a ruler, but over 20 years estranged from his family, 20 years in a foreign country. He's rejoicing because what happened to him, God meant it for good. So he could actually accept the pain and loss he had experienced. And for this reason, he was no longer angry, no longer bitter. He wasn't seeking revenge. He wasn't focused on his hurt. Because it wasn't important anymore. Because he was living for God's glory and for the good of other people. And if he had to bear some personal pain and trouble that others might receive the good, then he's okay with that. Because what was important was what God was doing. And so it begs the question, who do you serve? Do you serve God? Or do you serve yourself? See, that's what's at issue here. Because whether or not you're willing to forgive someone else for their offense against you is determined by who you serve. If you are all important, the world result revolves around me, then how dare you offend me? And I will not forgive you because I am all important. But if God is all important, and if God is working out all things together to good, and, I, and my pain is producing good for others, that I can forgive. Because God's going to redeem that pain and redeem that suffering for good. See, you have to be able to receive God's forgiveness for your sins. You have to first humble yourself, acknowledge your sins, forgive, confess your sins, but then receive God's forgiveness for your sins. Because if you live with guilt, if you live with shame... And you, you, and you live thinking, God can't forgive me. God has rejected me. God has cast me away. Then you won't be able to find peace. And you won't be able to seek peace with others. That's why Joseph's saying, don't be distressed any longer. Don't be angry with yourselves any longer. God has forgiven you. Accept his forgiveness in Christ. He's washed away your sins. And if you're feeling condemned for your sins, if you've come to Christ and you're feeling condemned for your sins this morning, that voice is not coming from God. Who's it coming from? Your accuser. It's Satan, the evil one. He's saying, you're not good enough. You're cast off. You're rejected. That's not Jesus. That's your accuser. What is God saying to you? He says this, come now. Let us reason together. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as wool. 
Though they are red like crimson, they shall be like snow. Paul said, it is God who justifies, who is to condemn. That means don't condemn yourself either. Receive God's forgiveness and rejoice in that forgiveness. And once you receive that forgiveness, once you know that you have peace with God, even though you're a desperate sinner, then forgive others as you have been forgiven. We pray it every, every Sunday. Forgive us our debts as we forgive the debts of others. Okay? As we forgive others their sins, their trespasses, their offenses. Okay? So pursue the peace and oneness that declares the gospel and makes Christ known. You know, this reunion we see in chapter 45 was not really ultimately about Joseph and his brothers and their own personal peace. It was really the bigger picture. It's about God fulfilling his promise to Abraham and making one nation. It's interesting that God has been mostly silent for all these years. Yes, he gave Joseph interpretation of dreams, but God has not spoken to Jacob in a long, long, long time. Jacob had no clue. He had no revelation from God, no knowledge as to what was going on with his family. Would his family survive? Where was Joseph? Was Joseph alive? Would Benjamin be safe? Jacob had no word from the Lord until chapter 46. And God spoke to Israel in visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, here am I. Then he said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for there I will make you into a great nation. And I myself will go with you. God is silent no more. Following the family coming together as one, God then confirms his covenant promise. He says, I will make of you a great nation. Confirming the promise he made to Abraham and to Isaac and indeed to Jacob. And that nation would be the dwelling place of God. The psalmist spoke of King David's, and you'll remember this, King's da King, da King David longed to build a dwelling place for God Almighty. And the psalmist prophesied, The Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling place. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. Well, you know that Jesus brings about that reality. There's a lot more we could say about that, but for sake of time, we can't. But Jesus is Emmanuel. He is God with us. He gives us rest. He says, my peace I give you. Uh, he gives us his rest. He is building his church, which is comprised of a diversity of people from all nations coming together as one people. Look at, just look ahead to, or let me turn there, Revelation 7, verse 9. After this, John says, he looked and behold, a great multitude that no one could number. What's that sound like? The Abrahamic, the promise to Abraham, like the sand on the seashore. John sees this eschatological vision, but it's from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, worshiping, crying out, okay? That's the fulfillment of God's promise. And that people is one, one people, one family, one body. Let me take you back to our Lord's Prayer in John 17. I, ask, I do not ask for these only, but for those who will believe in me through their word. That includes us, beloved. That they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they may also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, 
I have given to them that they may be one, even as we are one, I and them and you and me, that they may be perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Jesus' mission is building a united nation, one body, a people in whom God dwells, the fulfillment of his promise to Abraham, Revelation 21.3. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be, them with, be with them as their God. So this is one body, one people, one family, dwelling with God and with one another in peace. And that's why the New Testament speaks so strongly about divisions in our relationships. Beloved, we are in Christ. We are reconciled. We must not be as the world. The world is so divided. Relationships are breaking apart. Racial, reconcili- racial, racial divisions like I haven't seen since I lived in Detroit in the 60s when the, when the city was burning from racial riots. I remember those as a child. The world is divided. We as believers in our marriages, our families, our church, with our friendships, we must be one in humility and mercy and forgiveness. Because when there are divisions in our relationships, you're really denying the very gospel of Christ. You're, pro- you're proclaiming a false gospel of judgment and condemnation. You're proclaiming law, not grace, in which Paul says, reject the device of person. He's corrupt. He's warped. He's self-condemned. So whenever and wherever there are divisions and, and issues, pick up the phone. Go to that person. Pursue oneness. Pursue reconciliation. Joseph brought his family back together to live in peace in the land of Goshen. And so we also are to dwell in unity and peace, proclaiming the gospel of Christ, the gospel of reconciliation, oneness. So one, in that case, is the most wonderful number that you'll ever do. Pursue it. Amen. O Lord our God, there again is hope only in Christ. There is peace only in Christ. Deliver us from stubbornness, from pride and arrogance. Forgive us for thinking that we are better than others, that we have not sinned against others, that we have not offended others. Lord, let us Pursue that oneness, that beautiful number one that Jesus accomplished on the cross for the joy that was set before him. Oh, Lord God, truly make us humble. Make us accept all that you have for us because you're working on all things together for your own glory. In Jesus' name, amen.